Well, good morning everyone and a warm welcome to our Sunday service for the local ministry area of Broad Tyvee. So that's the churches in Cardigan and the surrounding area. My name is Christopher Frost. I'm one of the team vicars in this locality. And today we come from the beautiful church of St. Claudog in Kilgarran. It's lovely to be here and we'll be hearing from Reverend Peter Radcliffe. He'll be giving us a message from the Book of Acts today. We'll also be hearing a psalm, having a couple of hymns and some prayers as well. So whoever you are and wherever you come from, it's great to see you here today and I hope that you're blessed by this service. We're going to start with our first hymn. As usual, I'm going to encourage you to sing along at home, even if your spouse or your children or your animals are around you. The reason why is that it's so good when we just choose to worship God in the middle of a difficult time. When we do that, we remind ourselves of his sovereignty and his power, his love, and his promise that he'll be with us in our lives. And whoever we are and wherever we might be, we meet together today in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we're going to begin with a reading from Psalm 22, an excerpt from that great psalm of, of praise and worship to God, which also contains prophecy about what the coming kingdom of God would be like with the arrival of Jesus. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly, before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. 
All who go down to the dust will kneel before him, those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him, future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. Our reading today is from Acts chapter 8, beginning at verse 26. Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Candace, which means Queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they travelled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptised? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptised him. When they came up out of the water, The Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and travelled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So far, in the Acts of the Apostles, we have seen mass conversions, We witnessed through God's word the day of Pentecost where 3,000 souls were saved. We've seen crowds converted as the apostles preached and performed signs. We've seen Annas and Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin confounded by the healing of a crippled beggar. They tried to shut the disciples up. They tried to stop the spread of the gospel, but they could not because everyone could see the crippled beggar walking and praising God. They also couldn't deny the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, as this was a reality that many people had witnessed, over 500 men plus women and children. The disciples no longer cowered in fear before these people, but proclaimed Jesus' resurrection and his forgiveness of sins boldly. Today's text is different. Rather than seeing a massive number saved, we see one man converted, Now, many of us are not able to preach great evangelistic sermons like Billy Graham, but I think there's something here for all of us in West Wales today, in that we can all do personal evangelism. In fact, just as surely as God called Philip to go down to Gaza, he calls us to go to people we know and speak the gospel to them. So, if you've ever thought you're not gifted with the ability to preach to massive crowds, don't worry. This passage is for you. We see in this text a general movement now of the gospel to the ends of the earth by way of this Gentile African who was travelling back to Ethiopia after coming to Jerusalem to worship. Most scholars place this man in the category of a Gentile proselyte. That is one who is not Jewish, but still in some way had an interest or admiration for the God of Judaism, the God of Israel. God led 
Philip, Philip to a certain place. Our reading said, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. The first thing I want us to see today is that God was leading Philip every step of the way. We see that because we can read the story. For Philip, God was just giving him one step at a time. Step one, rise and go to the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. At this point, Philip doesn't even know why he is to go there. There could be a million different reasons why God would want him to do this. What I want us to see is that God leads us step by step. So Philip is obedient to the leading of God through the angel of the Lord. This is probably not the Lord Jesus Christ, but an angel messenger sent by God. Often in Acts, the writer of Acts, Luke, will have angels working in cooperation with the Holy Spirit. So who is this Ethiopian eunuch? He was no doubt dark-skinned, which is very vital here, in that the gospel is now beginning to span ethnic people groups everywhere. He comes from Africa. He is one who is in charge of the Queen's treasury. And because he works closely with the Queen and her court, he is a eunuch. This man is probably wealthy and probably a God-fearer, which is the title given to those Gentiles who practiced certain aspects of Jewish worship. He's on his way back from Ethiopia, from Jerusalem. Now that actually is quite a long trip in those days. Uh, today, uh, if we were allowed to, you could hop on a plane and get to Ethiopia from Israel in a few hours. In Philip's time, it was a five month trip each way. Because he was a eunuch, he was denied full access to the temple. According to Deuteronomy, eunuchs were denied access to the assembly of God. Here is a man who is not Jewish, but a Gentile Ethiopian. He's also unclean by the fact he is a eunuch. Yet God, in his mercy, sends Philip away from mass evangelism, where thousands were being saved, to visit this one man traveling back to his home far away. God led spirit to this certain man, and the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or someone else? Step two in Philip's journey of obedience. The Holy Spirit himself directs Philip to go over and join this chariot. That's an amazing act of sovereignty. God knew exactly when to send Philip and Philip arrives at just the right time. And he runs to the chariot. When he arrives, he hears the man from Ethiopia reading the scroll of Isaiah. Not just any place in Isaiah, but Isaiah 53. There's no way that he just happened to be traveling along the road reading Isaiah. God had prompted him to read as he prompted Philip to be there just at the right time. The man was reading from this chapter, Isaiah 53, and the thrust of this section in Isaiah is the innocence of Jesus Christ and the wickedness of humanity. It begs the question, what type of generation could kill such an innocent man? And the answer is a wicked generation. What a perfect place to present the gospel. 
Not only that, but the Ethiopian asks the perfect question. The eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say, about, say this, about himself or someone else? It is about someone else. Can we imagine the joy of Philip as he considers the power of God? What a God we serve. God led him straight to this man. God was working in Philip's life and no doubt working in the heart of the Ethiopian. And then Philip leads the Ethiopian to Christ. God does not need to tell Philip what to do next. He opens his mouth and out comes the gospel. The Bible tells us that he starts with the Isaiah 53 text and through a series of Bible verses and Bible uh, texts, he explains who Jesus is and what he did. He no doubt told this man, that he was a sinner in need of forgiveness. He told how God through his mercy and grace has made forgiveness possible through the sacrificial death of Christ on the cross. And he did this as they traveled. Now, in another act of God's sovereignty, as soon as Philip led this man to trust Christ as his savior and Lord, they come across a small body of water. The Ethiopian now is quite joyful as he realises the scriptures talk about a saviour. And as they go along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptised? Here was a man who, uh, by the standards of that time, should not have been saved. He was from a cursed ethnic group. He wasn't Jewish or even half Jewish. He wasn't a Samaritan. He was a eunuch denied access to the temple. He was on a lonely desert road, heading back to a pagan land. But God had placed his affection on him. God was the prime mover. God made it happen. Luke has already told us that this is a desert region. To travel from Jerusalem to Ethiopia was a five month journey through the desert. So the reason he was baptized straight away was because there was going to be a five month journey in which water was extremely scarce. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. Now I'm not sure, and I'm not, we're not told, but I have to think this man kept reading Isaiah. I think he read a few more chapters with passion as he rejoiced, because if he did, he would have come across Isaiah 56, this would have caused him to stop the chariot again and let out another shout of praise. Isaiah 56 says this, Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Tradition has it that this man went home to Ethiopia, sharing the gospel, and many in that land became followers of Jesus Christ. Go into all the world, beginning with Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts, and behold, I am with you to the very end of the age. Isn't it amazing to see how God works? Here's an account of the gospel coming to one foreigner, and then he takes it back home. So how does this passage apply to us in West Wales today? God isn't just a God of the Jews or a God of the Welsh or English. God is a God of all the nations. Let the nations be glad. Secondly, the Lord leads us step by step. He doesn't overwhelm us or play games with us. He leads us daily if we let him. And thirdly, God confirms what he's doing through his written word, the Bible. The Ethiopian eunuch would have seen his name in Isaiah just three short chapters later. God is faithful to his written word. The written word brings us to faith in a person, the living word, Jesus Christ. To him be glory in the church and the world for all time and eternity. 
Amen. And now we come to a time of prayer and intercession. May we pray. Father God, thank you for this reading and for the teaching that Peter has, has brought to us this morning. And we pray so much that your Holy Spirit would lead us just as he led Philip. Uh, encourage us, Lord, to be ready to give an answer for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Help us not just to be nice people, just living out our Christian lives, but help us to be ready to declare the word of the Lord, to tell other people the good news about Jesus, to point people towards your Bible, both the Old Testament and the New, so that they can discover themselves the love of Jesus Christ, the love he has for them. Lord, inspire within us a new love and a new passion and a new courage for sharing your word with the people around us so that they too might come into a saving relationship with you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Father God, this morning we thank you so much for uh, this beautiful world that we live in and the beautiful weather we've been enjoying that lifts our spirits. We thank you for the good news of, uh, of the vaccination programme, which is so successful in the UK, and we pray that would continue. We thank you that people are uh, finding themselves back in church again. Lots of people are coming back to church to worship and to share, uh, share their lives together. So, Father, we thank you for all these bits of good news, but we also pray that you would bless and protect our nation as we continue to go through this pandemic together. Help us not to be complacent, but to stay safe around each other. And we pray that you would greatly bless our emergency services and the NHS as they work so hard and take personal risks uh, to be out uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the war zone of the, of the hospitals where they're taking care of people who are very unwell. We pray for our key workers, Father, that you would bless and protect them too, give them grace and energy, and also that you'd be very close to people who are still homeschooling their children while perhaps juggling working from home at the same time. Father, we ask your blessing over the wonderful families in our local communities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we take a moment of silence now just to remember people who have died and to remember their example. We take a moment also of quiet just to pray for people who uh, might be feeling sick, who we know in our lives who might be feeling lonely. And we pray uh, in the quietness of our hearts for people who don't yet know you, who haven't experienced the Lord Jesus and his salvation, which we all need so much. Let's lift them to God now. Father, we thank you for our friends and family. We pray that you would grant them a happy issue out of their afflictions. And we pray that just as Philip had opportunities, God given opportunities, you would give us opportunities to share our faith boldly with the people around us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And finally, Father, again, we continue to pray for our governments in Westminster and Cardiff, that you would bless them and raise up godly MPs, that uh, our current MPs would look to you for help and for answers in the national situations of Brexit and during the pandemic and in all their other work. We pray that you'd give wisdom to our governments and also that you'd bless our royal family as they still very much miss uh, the Duke of Edinburgh. We draw our prayers to a close by saying, Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And let's join together in the words of the Lord's Prayer, firstly in Welsh and then in English. Ein tard ar hon atina nevoid sanctadia de enu, dela de denas, gunella de erlis, megis an anev, vetli an adail hevid. Dero eni hedu in bala benediol, Amadai ini in deledion, vel amadon ninai in deledwe, acna carwai ni i provedegaith, e the gwalet ni lag drug, canis e do tiel denas, al gathli, al gugoniant, an oisoisoith. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. I bendeth to you hotlashly or guitar de marbellus fidlan, the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you and those who you love now and forevermore. Amen.